It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. At least that's what Charles Dickens said when he was writing about the French Revolution. Now, some of you may think that I remember the French Revolution, but it really was a bit before my time. Not much, though. For those of you that I haven't met on the air, and even for those of you that I have, my name is Jack Leahy, KW5A, and I'm a retired professor here in Columbus, Ohio. And in just about three months' time, I'm going to celebrate my 60th anniversary as a continuously licensed amateur radio operator. Chatting with Wayne across the border recently, we got to discussing things like legacy antennas, the days of great propagation back in cycle 18, and all those things that we graybeards hold dear to our admittedly slowing hearts. And so I had dis agreed to discuss what life was like back when my first ham ticket arrived on January 16th, 1960, and some of the changes that I personally have experienced over these last 60 years. Back around 1956, when I was 11 years old, I received a Remco Crystal radio set for Christmas. Now, like most things which had to be assembled, I put it on a shelf and it gathered dust for a while. But one rainy afternoon, I decided to open the box and found, much to my great surprise, that it was really very easy to build a radio out of a kit. I don't really remember how long it took, but it was working before I went downstairs to my dinner. And working is the operative phrase here. While it said on the box that you could hear radio stations from all around the world, I found out that I could really only hear three stations. One was WIBG AM, the greatest rock and roll station in Philadelphia at the time. Another was the main dispatch channel for the Philadelphia Fire Department. Now that was cool. But the third station was a complete mystery. There was a voice who seemed to be speaking with people all over the world and using all kinds of interesting jargon. QSO, QSL, 73, and Whiskey 3 Idle Lewis Zebra. Hmm. I wonder why Ida and Lewis bought a zebra. I wondered what this was all about, and I was fascinated. When my dad, who was a Philadelphia policeman, came home, I asked him what was a W3 Idle Lewis Zebra. He thought for a moment. Well, I'm not quite sure, but I know that the fellow across the street has that big antenna in his backyard. After we uh, have dinner, let's go over and ask him and see what we can find out. His name was Dom Rossi, and Mr. Rossi may have been somewhat concerned when my dad, who was after all still in his police uniform, knocked on his door with his preteen son in tow. Are you one of those ham radio fellows? Pop asked. Yes. Am I interfering with your television or something? Nah, it's just my kid here heard something on his crystal radio, and we were wondering what was going on. He invited us in, and he and Pop exchanged polite, meaningless words. But Pop, ever the policeman, spotted Mr. Rossi sneaking a peat at his television where his family was watching the wonderful world of Disney. So we left rather quickly, and as we crossed the street, Pop commented, Well, now you know where that's coming from, at least. I was satisfied by what I had just learned, but much more satisfied still to meet the fellow who could talk to people all around the world. You've got to remember that this was at a time when a three-minute long-distance phone call from Philadelphia 
to my mom's family about a hundred miles away cost well over a dollar. A few days later one of Mr. Rossi's daughters knocked on our door holding what looked like a telephone directory in her hand. My dad said you can have this. He's got a new one but this one is only a couple of years old. He said if you like it you can keep it. I thanked her and squirreled the well-thumbed 1952 amateur radio call book up to my room and tossed it on the desk. Before bedtime I thumbed through the thick volume which contained the call sign of every licensed radio amateur in the world in the fall of 1952. It was fascinating. I enjoyed reading the addresses of operators in Great Britain and South Africa. Interesting names like the Old Schoolhouse, the White Cottage, Badger's Rest. I didn't know Badger's had to rest. The Granary and even the Old Vicarage. I also enjoyed reading the list of the radio prefixes for operators in other parts of the world. Now, where is this AC4 Tibet? Or F8, French Indochina? And where are L8, French Somaliland? Or MX Manchuko, I wondered. But best of all, I enjoyed reading the advertisements for amateur radio equipment. For months afterwards, I reread and reread all about the equipment on those 16 or so advertising pages that were bound to the front of the call book. Companies like Collins and National Radio and Hammerlund all advertised their newest products as did dozens of others often with the prices listed right beside. It was an introduction to a brand new world for me. I continued to listen in on Mr. Rossi's transmissions, along with the fire dispatcher and my favorite rock and roll station, until as the month of June approached, when relatives began asking me what I wanted for my birthday. Oh, that one was easy. I wanted anything to do with ham radio. My Uncle Joe gifted me with a membership in the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL, which came with a subscription to their monthly journal, QST. My first copy arrived in July 1957, and it was full of information about the International Geophysical Year, which incidentally had begun that month. It was fascinating even though I didn't have the background to understand much of what was being discussed. But it also had a great deal of information about Solar Cycle 18, which was occurring at that time, and which was breaking all kinds of records for excellent propagation on the amateur bands. Oh, I thought to myself, so that's how W3 Ida Lewis Zebra is able to work so many stations in different parts of the world. QST magazine was full of all kinds of good information and incidentally over the many years I've been licensed I've collected over 100 years of QST magazines from various sources and they now line the bookshelves in my ham shack here in Columbus. Not all of the news was good however I saw advertisements for devices that were required called Connellrad monitors, which every ham operator was required to use and which would alert him if radio stations went off the air because of air raids, period. Since I lived about seven miles from the naval base in Philadelphia, this was important to me. I read about the reallocation of the 11 meter ham band to something called CB radio and all of the controversy that ensued and read with a sense of wonder of the activities 
of the various radio inspectors of the Federal Communications Commission. They were able to track signals not only to specific dwellings, but often to a specific room. Clearly, there was a lot more to this hobby than I really understood. Because I was an unlicensed member of the ARRL, I received an offer in the mail for a reduced price copy of the ARRL license manual, and I actually saved up my pennies until I was able to buy one. I think it actually cost about a dollar twenty-five. It was even more informative. I learned the various classes of licenses, what the Morse code requirements were for each class, and where and when examinations were offered. I also learned about many of the rules which governed radio amateurs here in the U.S. And some of them were rather stringent, including the requirement that every single contact be recorded in a logbook. I learned that every transmission had to start and end with the operator's call sign, and in the event of a very long transmission, and I believe they meant that on 75 meters, the operator must identify every 10 minutes. Wow, there are lots of things that I would have to learn before I could become a ham. I continued listening on my little Remco crystal set and reading my QSTs and coveting all of the marvelous radio equipment that was available for sale. I came home from school one day, and my mom showed me a small article from our little weekly newspaper. The Ivy Ridge Amateur Radio Club announced that they would run classes that fall, leading up to the Novice Technician Class Amateur License for anyone who was interested. Better than that, they met at our local recreation center, which was just a short walk away. So one day, with my dad in tow, I went to the meeting, and there were about a dozen or so local hams, all of whom lived within about five kilometers of our house. Both Pop and I were amazed that there were so many guys operating radios in this little hilly working class neighborhood of Philadelphia. The club president announced that they would try to pair those interested in studying for the license with the closest operator. And since Mr. Rossi already had two fellows studying with him, who later became K3JLI and K3JLK, if I were interested, a fellow named Truxton Walmsley, known as Trux, W3JWC, who lived only five blocks away, would take me under his wing. When Pop and I first visited Trucks at his home, we found his radio station to be even more impressive than Mr. Rossi's. He had several surplus teletype machines running in a corner, and it was fascinating to watch the news from the Associated Press and the United Press International chattering away at about 45 words per minute. You know, on that first visit, he even taught me the seven letters of the Morse code. E-I-S-H-T-M-O. You can make a lot of words out of just seven letters, I discovered. I was hooked again, and I continued to visit with trucks about twice a week. And it was right around Thanksgiving of 1959 that he proctored the novice class examination for me. While it had to be graded by the FCC in Washington, Trucks at least reviewed it for me and told me that it appeared that I had passed with flying colors. And sure enough, I waited for bated breaths for over two months until I received that small brown envelope in January of 1960 from the FCC containing my new call sign KN3 O A R Wow I had known that Ivy Ridge Radio Club had several novice stations available for loan to newly licensed operators that helped to attenuate the obvious issue of expense 
for getting into radio for operators of my age. You could borrow a rig for six months, long enough to see if you were really interested in going further in the hobby. Trucks, along with my dad and my Uncle Joe, helped me to put up my first antenna, and we managed to shoehorn a 40-meter dipole onto our roof and into our backyard. We actually had to insulate the last five feet of the antenna or so, which sloped down past my mom's wash lines, so that we did not cause her any RF burns. It didn't seem to affect the signal very much anyway. That little Johnson Adventure 51 output and the NC60 receiver, which was very similar to the S3080 or other famous low-end receivers of the day, and while not the strongest signal on 40 meter CWs, certainly was perfect for my needs. I worked stations up and down the east coast of the United States and worked several DX stations. By the end of the six month trial period, there was no question that I really wanted to remain a ham operator forever. And so I have. Not having any more money than I had when I first got my license, I was becoming somewhat nervous as the six-month loaner period for the radio gear from the Ivy Ridge Club began to expire. My Elmer W3JWC was a great fan of homebrew radio gear and also of military surplus equipment. Indeed, looking back at it, I can't recall any equipment in this crowded shack that did not come from the military or was something he didn't build himself. He pointedly suggested that I do the same thing and remarked that while anyone could become an appliance operator, it was only real hams who built or at least modified their own rigs. Unfortunately, Philly had a very small radio row which couldn't hold a candle to the one in New York City. Trucks described it as a huge ham swap meet which covered at least a square mile in lower Manhattan and suggested strongly that if I searched there for appropriate surplus gear, I would be well rewarded. He also suggested equally strongly that I never take the first offer from any of the salesmen I would meet there. So one day, I arranged to meet my fellow club member Tommy Hannigan at the Trailways bus station downtown and within a few minutes we were on the hourly bus to New York. About 90 minutes later we were at the Port Authority bus terminal in Manhattan and after a few more minutes on the 8th Avenue subway to Chambers Street when we came above ground well I never saw anything like it in my life. There were about 15 blocks full of electronic stores of all persuasion everything from vendors who specialized in the smallest of components to those that were selling the brand new color TV sets and hi-fi radios here. And the crowds were gigantic. It seemed like every electronic experimenter or audiophile was there on the sidewalk and even walking in the traffic in the streets. Talk about kids in a candy store. Hannig and I wandered into the center of the action and it was at about the third or fourth store that we visited where we find the type of equipments we were looking for. I purchased an ARC5 transmitter and a BC348 receiver, while Hannigan bought a couple of World War II walkie-talkies, each one which seemed the size of a large building brick, and we purchased them for next to nothing. The only guarantee was, as the salesman explained, that it was guaranteed to be what it said on the faceplate, and whether it worked or not was up to our ability as budding technicians. 
Aside from the fact that it was difficult to carry all of this treasure back to the subway station, it was all very exciting and just one of the first of our many successful excursions into the Big Apple. I was quite fortunate. When I finally got the power supplies and other connections all figured out, and neither of these pieces of gear came with a schematic. Both the AORC-5 and the BC-348 seemed to work as promised. I got on 40 meters and made a couple of quick USOs with the fellows in the general area. And that's when I discovered that both the transmitter and the receiver drifted. In fact, as an aside, even here on Hamsphere 4, you might hear some of us old graybeards ending a CQ call with something like this is W3XYZ calling CQ and tuning. There's a reason for that. You might think that your transmitter started out say at 7035 kilohertz and you were zero beaded with your receiver. But then the transmitter might drift up about 5 or 6 kilohertz, while at the same time the receiver was drifting downward. I think that we might have been the first guys who actually invented spread spectrum for the amateur bands. But these were good pieces of gear, particularly when you let them warm up a little bit. And I made perhaps the most meaningful contact of my novice days one winter evening just before dinner time. I was calling CQ on 40 meters and was answered by a rather weak signal from a station ZL2BE, ZL2 British Empire. Now much later when I learned about gray line and things that enhance propagation, I realized that we were gray lining it on that contact. But to be quite honest, and apologies to Graham if you're listening, I had to actually look at a map to figure out where New Zealand was located. But we had a very nice but very short QSO, and he sent me a QSO card encouraging me in my amateur career. And that card still has a place of honor in my ham shack even today. There were other great rigs and receivers too, but since this is about nostalgia, I'll mention only one other transmitter, the one that I liked the most. I bought the Swan 500CX brand new out of the box in San Diego, California in 1970. I carried it with me for about 20 years, operated it from many locations afloat and ashore. It was a truly great transceiver, although it did not contain the work pans and it was well ahead of its time. We also tried all kinds of hijinks back in the day. One that I remember fondly was the night we arranged for a contest among all the Ivy Ridge Radio Club operators, the limitation of which was, of course, you couldn't use an antenna. You had to use a homebrew dummy load. In those days, most of us just made dummy loads out of a light bulb and you could adjust your power and watch the light grow brighter and brighter. But ever the experimenter, I decided what would happen if I ran two 75 light bulbs in parallel. The contest began on 10 meter CW ground wave, and I could faintly hear K3JLK about a mile and a half away from my QTH. When I fired up my doublet, Bill came back to me with a signal report of 559, and lo and behold, he and I were the winners of the world's first dummy load contest. Ah, the fun we had. But that's about as far as I can go this evening, except to wish all of you 7 threes, and I'll look for you all on Hamsphere 4.0. So, 7 threes from KW5A.